Uh, you got it? Okay. So this is the House Healthcare Committee. Uh, this is uh, Friday, March 25th, uh, a little bit, or 45. And uh, it's uh, it's our intention to we welcome, welcome our witnesses to help us understand, uh, have an overview of the blueprint for health. Uh, and I've asked Representative Donahue if she would uh, facilitate the uh, work here this afternoon. And so I'm going to turn it over to Representative Donahue. Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, as the chair referenced, uh, we're really interested. We've, we've got some members who have been around for a while. We have a lot of new members. But we haven't had, even for those of us who have an idea what the blueprint is, we have not had an update uh, on you know, what's happened over the last several years uh, in some time. And we have a lot of new members who really don't have any background on the blueprint. So that's what we're really looking forward uh, to today. Uh, not even any you know, new pending issues, but really uh, what it's all about. And um, so if you could introduce yourselves and then uh, we'll go around and introduce ourselves since we've got some new uh, guests speaking today. Thank you. I'll start off. My name is Ina Beckis. I am the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. And I will note that here in Waterbury today, we're having some internet issues. So if I cut out, I will rejoin by phone. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and, uh, Representative Donahue. I'm John Soroyan, Executive Director for Blueprint for Health. I'll turn it over to Julie. Hi there, good afternoon. I am Julie Parker. I am one of the Assistant Directors uh, on the Blueprint for Health team. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Reschnick, and I am a Data Analytics and Information Administrator with the Blueprint for Health. Thank you for having us. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, maybe uh, Representative Peterson, maybe we can go around quickly. Yes, I'm uh, Representative Arthur Peterson. I represent Roland District uh, 2, South of Rome. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Leslie Goldman, I am from Wyndham 3 which is the Bells Falls area. So northern, Northeast Wyndham County. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Burroughs. Uh, I am from West Windsor and I represent Windsor One, which is Heartland, West Windsor and Windsor over in the Upper Valley. And Donahue uh, from Northfield also represent Berlin. Uh, Bill Lippert uh, representing Town of Hinesburg. Roy Houghton, Essex Junction. Woodman Page, Newport. Mari Cordes, Lincoln. Oh, yes, and we have uh, by Zoom, uh, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah. Representative Brian Tina in Burlington, thank you. Thank you. Um, so if, uh, if you have a, a plan for how you want to handle, you do, wonderful. Okay, then I welcome <laughs> you to begin. Thank you. I'll begin. I'll just provide some uh, uh, high level overview of the blueprint program and orient you to where the program uh, sits within the agency of human services and then turn it over to Dr. Saroyan to introduce himself and then uh, the team Julie and Laura will um, and have prepared for you a um, blueprint overview that is comprehensive and will both describe the program and, and answer some questions about what's been happening with the program recently. Uh, Thank the you so much. Perfect. The uh, Blueprint for Health is a patient-centered medical home program um, for the state of Vermont. It is a model of it is a model that supports primary care um, and that is certainly intended to support high quality integrated primary care in the state of Vermont. Uh, the team will go into detail about the timeline uh, for the program. It is well established uh, with more than a decade of being operated in the state. It's a multi-payer uh, reform initiative where payers participate from Medicaid, commercial payers participate, and Medicare 
also um, contributes funding to the Blueprint for Health via the all-payer ACO model agreement that we have in place today. And the program uh, has recently joined in the Secretary's Office at the Agency of Human Services with the Office of Healthcare Reform uh, because the program is multi-payer in its foundation and is essential as we continue to move forward with healthcare reform that is focused on improving um, health and well-being, and that where we are looking to see delivery system transformation that is incentivized by payment reform. We, it's essential that we have a high performing strong primary care foundation in order for the state to be successful moving away from fee-for-service models of reimbursement and really thinking differently about providing care, uh, care that, again, is integrated, care that is appropriate to meet uh, people's needs and doing so in a way that can prevent, um, that can prevent uh, outcomes that are that can prevent you know, higher cost outcomes, for instance, um, in the future. So that's, that's a brief overview of the program, um, where it sits with the Office of Healthcare Reform, as well as um, the blueprint in the Office of Healthcare Reform. We also have the Health Information Exchange Program, and it and the blueprint um, are complementary in the support of healthcare reform initiatives using both data as well as the um, as well as the model of care that Blueprint has established with primary care. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Saroyan now. I'm very pleased uh, that Dr. Saroyan has joined the Blueprint for Health as the executive director. I'll let you hear directly from him. Um, but it's, it's very fortunate that we have him joining our team at the state of Vermont. And it's very exciting um, that, he's recently, that he's recently joined us at the Agency of Human Services. Thank you, Ina. Good afternoon, Representative Donahue, Chair Lippert, and members of the House Committee on Healthcare. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your invitation to introduce myself. I will keep my remarks uh, about myself brief in both the interest of time and because I submitted a more detailed overview of my background for your perusal. I'm a board certified pediatrician with subspecialty certification in hospice and palliative medicine. I'm also a certified hospice medical director. My interest in medicine began at the age of 15 following the death of a favorite teacher's son. My professional and personal goals have been developed by the guiding principle of serving others following his death at a very young age. Whether as a physician, a musician, I play banjo music and sing and do a lot of stuff like that, father, husband, neighbor, friend, or colleague, I ask myself the following question repeatedly, how can I make today and future days better for others? My work in Vermont began in March of 2013, following an almost 10 year career at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University in New York City, where I was jointly appointed in the departments of anesthesiology and pediatrics. Before my position with the state of Vermont, I worked for Bayada Home Healthcare, first as the full-time medical director for hospice, and after eight years, the regional medical director for hospice services across the entire practice. It's an honor to serve as the director of Blueprint for Health at the Agency of Human Services, in three quick months, I have become more and more aware of how big the shoes of the founding and pre preceding predecessors, Dr. Craig Jones and Beth Tansman are. I'm greatly enjoying the work, putting uh, my management and people skills to use. I rely heavily on my experience as a provider who visited hundreds of people in their homes, oversaw thousands of care plans for end of life, and had innumerable, innumerable, innu innumerable collaborative conversations with providers around the state. Lastly, I live in Norwich with my wife and two sons who are 13 and almost 11. I will now introduce my colleagues who will present an overview of the Blueprint for Health's current programs. Julie Parker is a licensed clinical mental health counselor and one of our two assistant directors. She has been with the Blueprint for two years. Prior to the Blueprint, she worked in the designated mental health system in various capacities for over 20 years. Julie is passionate about the Blueprint's unique ability 
to support communities by integrating physical and mental health for whole person health and wellness. Laura Reschnig has an MA in economics and is one of our two data analytics and information administrators. She has worked for the Blueprint for nearly three years, managing payment operations for the Women's Health Initiative and the SPOKE program. She is also a member of the Agency of Human Services Institutional Review Board. She cares deeply about using data and analytics to inform decision-making and healthcare. I will now turn the floor over to Julie to begin the presentation. So if I may just ask for a moment, um, in doing the presentation, different people prefer different ways. If folks have questions, should they ask along the way or would you prefer to wait to the end when some of those questions might have been answered along the way? I am open. I am happy, Laura, I think Laura and I would be happy to answer any question as it comes up. And I think if it's going to be talked about more later, we could just share, we'll, we'll share a little bit more about that later. Will that, will that work? That's terrific. Yes, we have a question already from Representative Cordes. <laughs> okay, great. <Hi. laughs> Welcome to the Healthcare Committee. I had no idea that the uh, Agency of Human Services had an IRB. Um, so that's new to me. At some point, you don't have to answer that now, but um, uh, uh, the Institutional mm -hmm. Review Board, I'd love to hear more about that. That's and I can are doing chat to, help to make sure that it's uh, not harmful. Wonderful. We can, yep, we're, we can, we see your screen perfectly. Okay, so wonderful. Set. Great, thank you. Um, just the way it's set up, I don't see if hands are being raised. So um, if someone on my team could help me if there are hands raised, or again, feel free to just interrupt. I'm completely fine with that. So um, uh, I'll handle that here. I will okay. let you know if there's a question. Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for having us. We appreciate any opportunity we can to share the wonderful work um, that the Blueprint is doing in our community. So really appreciate the time and your interest. Um, so I will move forward here. Let's see, here we go. So I, I have a timeline at the end of the presentation, but just for time's sake, I'm going to start here in 2010 and we can review the timeline further if we'd like to at the end. Um, I wanted to start here in 2010, um, in terms of the statutory framework, I'd just like to read this a little piece of the framework. Integrating a system of healthcare for patients, improving the health of the overall population, and improving control over healthcare costs by promoting health maintenance, prevention, care, and care coordination and management. And then just another little snippet, 2016 was when um, our ACO agreement was, was signed, and we can talk about that further as we progress. Um, there we go. I think one thing that's really interesting about the blueprint and one thing that I really have loved um, when I did my work in Franklin County, I worked at the designated agency there for 15 years and working closely with the state from that lens is just how much they innovate, how much we work with communities and really want to hear and understand what's happening in each community. Each community has a little bit of differences for, for various reasons. And we want to make sure that we're, we're checking in with them, we're talking about it, we're looking at their needs and we're saying, what, what kind of changes need to happen? How can we impact that? How can we support that? How can we look across what's going across our Agency of Human Services? What is Dale doing? What is Departmental Health doing? What is um, VDH doing? And how we can innovate together um, and really transform our health system. So I think that's a real key part of the blueprint um, that I feel like it's important to talk about and something that I really value and I know our, our system values as well. So as Ina mentioned, the foundation of our blueprint is our patient-centered medical homes. And so, uh, and I'll talk about patient-centered medical home a little bit, a little bit further and what that means, but generally speaking, it is to make sure that we are seamlessly supporting patients' care and helping them with their care as they choose and would like to be involved in. So we want to look at the health of the population. So we're ensuring that screenings are done for what's called social determinants of health. Uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, interpersonal violence, uh, mental health, depression. So we want to make sure that those conversations are being had and being supported. We want to ensure that we're helping and supporting patients manage their chronic health conditions, preventing chronic health conditions, if possible, those being exacerbated in some way, such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma. 
We also want to increase uh, a patient's experience of care and understand that more. Are they able to connect with their primary care provider or that office? Are they getting their needs met? Are questions being asked to them for their whole health? So that is their reproductive health, their physical health, their emotional health, their mental health, health and wellness overall. So we want to ensure that those questions are being asked. And in the end, our hope is that it does reduce the cost of care and increase our, our Vermonters um, wellness overall and physical, mental health being, you know, to the place that they desire it to be. So uh, one of the ways that we get information from our communities is the Blueprint Executive Committee. So um, they are really stakeholders and really share with us what they're seeing in our communities. And that is a mix of folks. Um, we just had our, our first one this, this uh, week with John at the helm, and it is a mixture of um, insurance providers, uh, clinicians, primary care providers, um, our commissioners or designee. So we try, in, and it is in statute, and we try to really have a great breadth of information from all different parties in our state the best that we can um, to inform us of decisions we're making or if we want to work on something new, what would that look like? Would people be you know, wanting to do that? So um, the full list of the statute of folks that are invited to come as voting members is in our blueprint manual and I'll have a link to that at the end. So we have a statewide net network of what we call hospital or health service areas. People use them sometimes interchangeably. And so when the blueprint started, um, stakeholders came together and they said, who do we want to be our administrative entity? Who is gonna take this funding and disperse it to the community um, with our all payer model and, and blueprint programming? So um, there's one administrative entity within, within each health, health service, hospital service area. They must be um, centers for Medicare and Medicare, Medicaid and Medicare services. And, um, it's broken up into 13 health service areas and under those are community health team leaders as well, which I'll talk about, and our community improvement facilitators for each health service area. So for each health service area, we have a program manager and uh, the state provides a grant to that administrative entity each year to provide for their salary. And, and the quality improvement facilitator salary. We have some contracts that are separate, but some that go through the administrative entity. Um, uh, and they have primary oversight of all the blueprint tasks that need to be done, whether that's putting data, hiring, um, et cetera. They administer the funds. Now, it's really important to note that uh, most of our administrative entities are the hospitals, um, but that position in and of itself, the program manager, is supporting both the hospital practices and any independent practices <laughs> that are patients that are medical homes. And, um, and they're also responsible for what we call a community collaborative or an accountable co communities for health where they bring partners together and talk about their goals and, and things they want to work on in their communities. So a little bit about the blueprint programs we're gonna talk about is the patient center medical homes, community health teams, our hub and spoke, which is the system of opioid use disorder treatment and our women's health initiative, pregnancy intention initiative. So how do you become a patient center medical home? Um, you have to meet NCQA guidelines, which stands for National Committee on Quality Assurance. Um, and so you, you enter your practice, you go into a system, it's called QPASS, and you have to meet the national standards. So um, there's basically six tiers of areas that you have to meet certain credentials or certain criteria under, you know, but just as a, as a few examples, you know, that you might, someone might be saying, you know, you need to be doing X amount of colorectal screenings, you need to be doing depression screenings, you need to be doing flu vaccinations, you need to be um, just uh, patient experience. One of the things for uh, the NCQA is you have to do a survey of your patients and, and see how they're, how they're feeling about their patient experiences. So um, it, there's some things that are set that they have to absolutely follow every year. And then there's some flexibility on things that um, our quality improvement facilitators can help them choose, or it might be certain things that we're asking at the state that they work on. Um, so that's how you, you, you start off being a patient center medical home and then also ongoing work. So as you're getting information about, gosh, we are really low on our colorectal screening. So we want to, you know, 
look at that and say, how do we reach out to folks to get that? How do we reach out to folks to get their flu vaccines? What can we do? How do we continue our, our quality improvement to meet those measures? So each hospital health service area has a quality improvement. Yeah, we, we have a question here, if we could just rep yeah. represent Peterson. Yeah, yes, Julie, I, I just have a question on what you, I, I'm not getting what you mean by medical home. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so that is where someone would be getting most of their medical care. We call it their medical home. Most of their care is done, their primary care is done at the medical home. So, okay, so the homing of, of, of the medical care. All right. So, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So, if you, if you go to a doctor, that's your medical home. Yep. Yes. Probably. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Thank you for, for helping me clarify that term too. Yeah, can I ask if this is Bill Lippert? I just, I think to help clarify as well, it's like, let me just ask a question that I think I know the answer to, but uh, I think others may wonder about is, is every primary care practice a part of the blueprint for health in Vermont? No. No. Um, so that's, that's part of what you're describing is how a primary care practice becomes part of the blueprint through this yes. qualifying to be a medical Correct. home? Correct. I mean, someone may they still don't. say, you know, they feel like their primary care doctor is their medical home. They get most of their medical care there. Um, but in order to be part of the blueprint, you must meet the, the NCQA requirements to be a, um, a, a, you know, patients, what we call a patient-centered medical home and receive blueprint funds, et cetera. You know, we, I don't have the number off hand and I'm happy to, to share that with you. I mean, I, I, I like to say, and there might be some practices I'm not aware of, but I mean, we're, we're, we're in the 90s, 90% 90 of, of folks. You know, I can think of a couple practices. Uh, Dr. Corrigan, for example, was a doc in St. Albans and I think he's retiring. Um, you know, one of the things is you have to have your electronic medical record to a certain part. He knew his retirement was coming up. It's just not something that he was wanting to to do. And so unfortunately then, you know, we don't tick off that box for, to be a patient center medical home. So that may be one example why someone says, you know, at that time, I'm just not interested in that, but there are some key things that have to be in place to, to move towards that patient center medical home, or you can make a plan to move towards that. But, um, you know, some folks are just not, not interested in, in doing that. Yeah. Julie, I'm just going to restate the large majority of of primary care practices in the state of Vermont, both practices that are owned by hospitals, independent practices, and federally qualified health center primary care practices participate in and are deemed as patient-centered medical homes in the blueprint program. So Julie said it's, it's a, somewhere above 80% of practices, so it is the large majority. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying, you know. Yeah. So I just have a follow-up question to that. Yeah. What is the benefit to a, a, a practice to be in a medical home? That we'll definitely talk about that as we proceed. Okay. With, is you. that okay? Sure. Yeah. Yep, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Great. Um, so um uh, so part of the NCQA is, is that we provide a quality improvement facilitator to help those primary cares from the very beginning when we, when we went to this model to help and support them to meet those criteria and also ongoing yearly, you have to reattest, so to speak, um, show your quality improvement, show what you're working on and those kinds of things. So um, that's one thing, a, a main focus of our quality improvement facilitators. Um, also, you know, for example, um, there was just a, a wait time uh, work that the state had done and our quality improvement facilitators, you know, shifted what they were doing, help practices um, figure out how to extract that data from their electronic health records to then <laughs> provide that to the state as, as they were asked to. So they can shift pretty quickly if there are state priorities that we need from primary care, uh, the primary cares that are involved um, in, in, again, the patient center medical homes. Um, and they're just constantly looking at ways to improve care within, within the, um, our patient center medical homes. Okay, I'm just going to turn this over to Laura for a second, who I forgot we actually have the slides, so she can share this. Uh, uh, just one moment, we have a question here. Sure. 
uh, Representative Goldman? It's not really a question, it's just a comment. I think that you did a really nice job putting a link in your presentation for a description of a primary care medical home. It's an article and it will take you to, if one's interested in going further, to learn about that. So just so people in the committee know that that's available. Thank you. It's on slide. Probably in the 30s. 10, no, I'm looking at slide 10. Oh, okay. For some reason, my, my I can't go back on my screen right now. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but thank you for sharing that, appreciate it. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura for a, a, few, a few slides. Great, thank you, Julie. So this slide shows the growth in the patient-centered medical home program since July 2008 when it began to just a few months ago. And one thing that's notable is that there was steady growth for several years after it began, but that growth has leveled off in recent years. And as discussed, that's partly just because we've reached many of the primary care practices in the state, and so many are participating that there are fewer that we can really bring into the program. So as of December 2001, December 2021, um, we had 135 patient-centered medical homes. And at, the, at those patient-centered medical homes, we had 147 CHD staff, so community health camp staff. And we have a little bit over 300,000 patients that we're attributing to those patient-centered medical homes. And approximately a third of those are Vermont Medicaid patients. Next slide. No uh, we have a question. Yeah. No. <laughs> I just want to understand your data. I'm sorry. So are you saying that you have 135 practices, 135 recognized primary care medical homes, which represent 305,000 patients? That sounds like a lot. I mean, I'm not understanding that, the relationship. Sorry. I'm going to bring that slide back up. I'm so sorry. There's some, my... However, this is right now, it will only let me go forward. So one, just get, let me no pause worries. for one. No oh, 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 oh. Here we <laughs> Bring on one more minute, my apologies. I, we're not, I'm not used to Zoom and um, uh, I don't know what my, why my, uh, my computer was so, so just, just if I can repeat there. the question or representative. I'm okay, so. Under, yeah. Oh. If you're asking me to repeat the question, I'm just trying to understand this. Is you're saying that there are 135 primary care medical homes in the state? Is that the blue line? That's right. Yes. Okay. And that 135 practices represent 305,000 people. Yes. I'm just looking so, to see that connection. Yeah. So that that so they. What we have done is we attribute patients, and, and I can provide more detail on this in, in written testimony, is we attribute patients on, based on a two-year look back. And so that 300,000 number, that 305,854, that represents how many patients we have attributed to those 135 practices across two years, across all of the payers who are participating in our program. Yeah, I'm just not really understanding. So could you tell me how many per practice? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, just as a general ratio, not that it would be absolute because I know one is big and one is little, but maybe it doesn't. Um, I mean, so yeah, I'm, I'm I, just trying to understand. I apologize, Representative. I don't I don't have an average number of patients per practice. Um, we do okay, have sorry. like a That's we do okay. have um Thank you, Frozen. Can oh, you hear us, Laura? No, that's yeah, I can hear it. Sorry, I, I can't see anyone, so I don't want to talk over anyone. Um, apologies. Um, so we do have significant variation in the size of our primary care practices, from you know very small practices that may only have one um, doctor to you know practices in Burlington that could serve you know thousands of people every month. Um, I would say that um, be, partly that number. Um, it, it makes more sense when you just think of how many primary pr care practices in the state are part of our program. As we discussed on the last slide, the majority of primary care practices in the state really are participating in the blueprint. So maybe that helps make sense of, of why that number is so substantial. But so if I could follow up as Representative Donahue, so not all, if, if, a, uh, if a practice is a blueprint practice, 
that doesn't necessarily mean all of their patients are attributed patients. Is that correct? Or all, or are all of their patients attributed? So it's we we have some uh, we have some different algorithms that we use to determine um, how we attribute patients. And and like I said, I can I can provide more information written testimony. It's um, not not an area that I. I can recall every detail of right now, I, I apologize. But um, if we're looking for where a patient has the majority of their care. So if you're receiving the majority of your primary care at a practice, then that is where you would be attributed to. And if that was a patient-centered medical home, then that patient-centered medical home would, would have you attributed as a patient. I think there's a really- I, I think that I'm sorry, I think the question's coming up because if we have 80 to 90% of the practices are blueprint practices, but we only have 50% of the population of Vermont as an attributed patient. So that was the disconnect I think people were uh, trying to sort out. I, I apologize. Um, so partly that's, you know, um, there could be people who are in non-participating that are, um, members of non-participating payers that are then not attributed as patient-centered medical home patients in this model. We're looking at um, patients who are members of the participating payers, so that could be part of the disconnect. But I think it's really important to note that the program is payer agnostic. Mm -hmm. The services that are provided by a patient-centered medical home that's recognized in the Blueprint program are provided blind to the payer type of any individual that is being served by that practice. So there's full, it doesn't matter if, you know, there are payers that are covering Vermonters that do not participate in contributing funds for the blueprint programs and services. Uh, however, the program and services are fully available to all Vermonters, regardless of insurance type or insurance status. So if you're uninsured and you're, and you're um, receiving services from a practice, for instance, you are equally uh, uh, served by the programs and services that are available. I, I apologize for misunderstanding the question. No, that, that's fine. No, I think we're all set now. I think we, it, the question was likely very unclear. It's it's always tricky when you you're learning a new uh, presentation medium. I can I can see people now. I figured out that button. So that's yeah. awesome. Are there any additional questions about this slide? I think we're good for now. Great. Thank you. So earlier there was a question about. Um, essentially what the incentive is for a practice to participate in the patient-centered medical home program. And this slide speaks to that. So in addition to the funding that we provide to practices for community health team staffing, we also have payments that we send directly to practices. And these are the result of getting that NCQA recognition. And so every practice that gets that NCQA recognition gets a base payment of $3 P PM, PM, so per patient per month for commercial patients, uh, $4.65 for uh, Medicaid patients, and then $2.05 for Medicare patients. In addition to that base payment, practices are also eligible for two performance payments. And so one of the performance payments is based on healthcare utilization, and this is measured at the practice level, and they can receive an, an additional up to $0.25 cents per member per month for both commercial and Medicaid based on their um, outcomes and the service utilization measure. And then they're also eligible for a performance payment for a quality measure. And this one is measured at the community or health service area level. And once again, this is up to an additional 25 cents per member per month. And for this measure, we look at different outcomes such as the percent of adolescents with an annual well care visit and the percent of children up to three years of age who have had a developmental screening. So the practices who are part of our program can see, oh, receive gosh. these monthly payments in exchange for meeting these different quality and resource utilization metrics in addition to the NCQA certification. Okay, before you move, you got to <laughs> pull that out so we don't have to go backwards. Uh, we have a question from Representative Page. Uh, I'm curious, 
what is the total amount uh, that these practices receive per month? So, so that depends on the number of attributed patients. So, um, well, it, how, how much is it per patient then? So, if, if a practice um, is not receiving any of the performance payments, then they would receive that um, one, yeah. that um, bullet point one, they would receive that base payment for each type of um, patient. So if it was a Medicare patient, they would receive $2.05 for each of those Medicare members per month that were attributed to them. Then, you know, if they have um, a performance payment, let's say that they've reached up to the $25, the 25 cents for that re that healthcare utilization performance payment, then they would receive that on top of that for that Medicare payment. So for example, they would now receive $2.30 for that same Medicare patient if they now have that healthcare utilization performance payment. And then you would add another 25 cents for that performance payment for the quality measure um, if they qualify for that as well. So it's a practice. Yeah. Are there yeah. any additional funds that a practice would receive? So these are the payments that go directly to the practices. Um, we also give out community. So participating, participating payers also provide community health team funds. And these are paid out quarterly. They're also based on the attributed patients, but these go to the administrative entity in each Blueprint Health Service area. So those don't go directly to the practices, although the practices can benefit from the community health team staff that are hired as a result of those funds. And we'll talk about that a little bit further, about the community health team. Go ahead, excuse me. Yes, I just wanted, um, because I'm not, I'm not totally clear about the question. The, these are supplemental to the fact that the insurer, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial, is paying the full regular visit fee. These are, addition, these are on top these of... These are on top okay. of, regardless yes. of the person even saw the doctor that month. It's not based on visits. It's just that they are part of the practice. Is that right? No, I was just saying, all of us have this up, so she may want to look at us. Just have the dialogue. I can't hear both so, at one. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just um, so the the way that these are paid out, um, they're paid out by the insurers based on the, the insurer's own attribution algorithms. Um, the blueprint doesn't come up with um, the amount that should be paid to each practice. For example, um, Gainwell's the claims administ administrator for Medicaid has their patient algorithm. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont has their own patient al attribution algorithm, and that's how they determine which patients they're paying on behalf of. Does that, and, do you have a follow up, Representative Page? Well, it just seems like such a min minimal amount. I don't understand why any practice would want to join up on, on this community um, mm -hmm. program or whatever it's called, uh, Blueprint program. And we'll, We'll talk a little bit about community health teams in a few slides, and that may um, share just a little more information um, about the about about additional benefits. Okay, I look forward to it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Should I move forward? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So. Um, so this slide gives a, an accounting of um, those numbers that we previously showed, the um, payers uh, claim-based attributions. So this is showing what it was in at the end of 2021, quarter three. Uh -huh. And so, so one of the key points to, to see from this graph is that we have a number of payers participating in the program. The payers who have the largest number of attributed patients are Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont, Medicaid, and Medicare, but we still have significant participation from MVP, and we also have members who are participating in the program from Cigna, or attributed to the program. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. So I want to touch a few minutes on community health teams and, and the funding slide will be further here. So um, the role of the community health teams is to support our primary care providers in identifying root causes of problems, um, 
supporting with mental health, screening for the social determinants of health, as we talked about, um, connecting them with effective interventions to support and manage chronic conditions if that's part of their care plan and their desire. Um, and you know, just overall offering connections with care teams. So if we have folks that maybe have you know their medical home, they get most of their care from their primary care, but yet um, maybe they're uh, seeing um, an endocrinologist and they also have some other specialty services and it's someone that's helping coordinating care and providing, uh, providing that care coordination and support to the patient. And in the end, you know, the hope is it's also supporting the primary care providers and nurses that um, really we know their time is very limited with patients. And so when we have folks that are coming in with many social determinants of health, they're able to do a warm handoff to someone on the community health team that has that expertise that can do referrals, short-term treatment, um, close the loop on services, coordinate care. So, uh, Funding for, so we, again, as Laura mentioned, so funding will go to an administrative entity to provide community health team to the community. So there's there, the typical funded positions are nurses, mental health clinicians, case managers, care coordinators, panel managers, dietitians, and our community health workers. But what we do know, right, is that um, helping a community as a whole isn't just about the, the folks that we fund. Um, although, you know, we certainly, um, can only provide so much, but the larger community is our designated agencies, our chronic care folks, our peers, our recovery coaches, our food shelves. So we know it takes an entire community to, to support each other. Um, and that's what we do here in Vermont. So I just wanted to, to point that out. So, so our I, I, yeah, I, have quite, I have a question right now because it's always yeah. been a confusion for me. Sure. Um, one of the things that the blueprint is clearly about is addressing, coordinating for, uh, supporting for chronic care. Yep. And yet we have this totally separate uh, entity under the, I don't know if it's under the Department of Health or where it is, but Vermont's Chronic Care Initiative. Mm -hmm. What is yep. the difference? You know, is the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative a under or part of the blueprint or is it separate and why would it be separate if they're both addressing chronic care? I'll, I will try to address that. And then uh, Ina, if you wanna, or John chime in. So the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, I like to think of it as a continuum with our work. And so I do, while we are working in our community communities to support um, obviously chronic health conditions, that's not all the community health team does. One, we're payer agnostic and we work along the spectrum of any conditions that are happening. So while obviously um, we want to support our folks that have chronic health conditions and be, you know, providing care coordination and all those things, there's also a large patient load of practices that we're supporting as well. So there are times that we refer to the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative Program from the community health team so they can take on a higher level of collaboration and coordination. And there's a few other tasks that, that they do. They support folks that are brand new to Medicaid. Um, and they have a few other tasks that, that I'm not 100% aware of, just to be honest, but I know that they have cert certain charges they do. And they also sort of, I see them as a continuum with the community health team. Ina, do you have anything? Go ahead. Yeah, I can. I can just building on what Julie explained. Um, the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative is a a short term intervention to um, assist Medicaid enrollees in particular with um, necessary care coordination and services, typically to stabilize those in individuals, and a part of that. Uh, stabilization is often that the uh, chronic care team is working to establish a relationship between the enrollee and a patient-centered medical home. So you can imagine a scenario where someone um, has um, become disengaged for whatever reason with patient-centered medical home, or perhaps has never been engaged. Um, there may be outreach to that individual um, for a number of reasons uh, by the chronic care initiative to uh, work with that individual, get that person stabilized and then connected with a long-term relationship with a medical home. So an example could be that a, a person who is um, 
who is currently without a home uh, may be identified in the community through what uh, the community networks and through um, those networks which are connected to the chronic care initiative that individual could be referred to the chronic care initiative for instance um, again to work with the person to become stable with their condition or conditions and to be connected for a longer term relationship ongoing with a patient centered medical home at which time the chronic care team would disengage um, from their work with that individual. And like Julie said, there are times where that intensive service from the chronic care team for a Medicaid enrollee might be something that um, is, is, is called from the patient centered medical home um, to help stabilize that individual. I think it's a, and I think it's a, a really, really great question and something that we do clarify from time to, to time in, in our community. So appreciate that. So as Laura mentioned, um, you know, there's the, the funding that she talked about. Um, so our additional funding is, is to fund our community health team payment structure. So Health service areas receive um, funding to, to hire community health teams. So that's an additional money of $2.77 per patient per month for commercial payers and Medicaid and $2.51 for Medicare. So that is on top of the other funding that we talked about. Um, and in terms of community health team, um, go ahead. Was there a question? I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, and, and so the way, uh, again, the, the, so this is a little bit different where the funding comes to the administrative entity. So the, the, the funding comes to, let's just say Northwestern Medical Center um, in St. Albans. And for instance, what they chose to do is they hire the nurses that go to the primary care docs. They pass through some money to independent practices. Um, and they also work with their designated agency to hire the mental health clinicians that are in the practices. So they have a unique way they use their money. Um, that's talked about with the blueprint, that's planned, that's you know something we work together on to say, what is the best way to provide services within this community to the medical practices, to the independent practices, et cetera? Do you want to contract with your DA, et cetera? So there's different ways that each health, uh, health service area manages their community health team money. And like we talked about earlier, there's some flexibility in terms of um, are there dietitians needed? Are there nutritionists? Are there, um, you know, uh, social workers? Are there community health workers? So there is some flexibility in terms of how they use that community health team money, and they should be talking about it as a community as well. So there's there's three different ways also they get payment, and that this is for our core community health team staff, and then we're going to talk about additional funding for medication assisted treatment staff and our pregnancy intention program. So I'll, I'll talk further about that, but just in terms of this specific payment structure for the community health team, is there any questions on that before I move on? Uh, look, oh, we have one. Well, okay. uh, I have a question. This is a uh, Bill Lippert. Uh, so. One of the things I've always heard is that uh, some that the patient doesn't necessarily need to know or want to know yes. whether their medical home, whether their primary care physician is a participant in the mm -hmm. blueprint for health. What they know is that there, if they are, there there might be some of this additional funding may be allowing that primary care uh, office to hire a mental health clinician yes. who's working in the same setting yes. to, to offer what people talk, sometimes refer to as a soft handoff or a, yep. war, a warm, warm, warm handoff. handoff. Yep. Not soft, warm handoff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's like soft, soft and warm, warm and it's, yes, abs yes yeah. absolutely. So, so this is so where that, I would, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I'm just saying, that I think, I think part what we're, what we're spending a lot of time on, and it's good that we, we do need to understand how the funding works and all that, but the, the, the practical impact is that, in fact, primary care practices that participate in the medical home model and the blueprint for health do get both resources for that particular practice, the payments per model, member per month, but then they also benefit from the work of these community health teams. And it's... And it, it, but it's it's not necessarily 
labeled blueprint for health to the to the community or to the patient. This Correct. is this is either enhanced. I'm, 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 I'm saying it, but I'm asking as well. Like, yeah, hundred percent. Enhanced support. Yes. For these yes. patients who are working with those primary care practices, is that am I getting understanding You're, that correctly? Absolutely. And you know what? Sometimes even the staff doesn't know where their funding comes from to be paid. And we're okay with that. Um, yes. And as Ina mentioned, it's payer agnostic. So if a practice, you know, one of the tricky parts is, um, you know, there's only so much funding, right? Only so many positions that can be hired. So somebody may not be there every single day at a certain practice, depending on their attribution. But essentially, yes, the primary care docs are so thankful that they can do that warm handoff to someone and, and have that patient gain support. And so I feel like what we hear is certainly this is one of the most beneficial um, services that they can, can have embedded within their practice. Um, so, and, so, and, so what I've, some of what I've heard over time is that it's better. It's a whole lot better than just saying, well, let me give you a phone number to call to make a referral. Uh, because we know that the referral rate, the rate of actual referral is much lower than if you can actually introduce somebody. Yep, 100%. Yeah. Uh, pre well, pre blueprint, I used to, I, I was a crisis worker and a case manager and, uh, you know, and working in St. Albans and, and, and a primary doc would call crisis and say like, we need somebody, this is pre blueprint. And I'd be like, our crisis team will be right over, right? Or we'll meet them in the parking lot so we can even do a warm handoff for services. Um, but yes, we know that if someone is having a challenging time, having that warm handoff and having that person to talk to and follow up on in the moment, someone's more likely to engage and stay engaged, right? It's just, I mean, it's human nature. Yeah. Representative Goldman has a question. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand this. Um, sure. From what I understand, to do the work, to become a primary care medical home, you go through, I would think, a somewhat rigorous process mm -hmm. that then becomes an honor. You know, that it allows you to take your practice and what you provide to your patients to the next level. It allows you to create an infrastructure around them so when different things are needed, those services are in place. So the process itself has merit because it does create a network, I think, around patients to support them through different parts of their needs. Does that sound right? I mean, it, absolutely. It's pretty, yeah, it's a rigorous process to be able to do this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why- I mean, Beyond the money. I mean, I get the money is important, absolutely. but it's beyond yeah. the money. It, it, I'm not a primary care provider, but I will say, and John, you can correct me, but I, I think it also holds people accountable in different ways, like not in a negative way, but certainly like we can go about our work and, and forget to look at things again, not in a negative way, but when we're sort of at that level of being a, a patient center medical home, we do have to stop and say, wait a minute wow, we, why didn't we do depression screenings this year? That What happened to our workflow that we forgot to do that or we just stopped doing that? We want to be doing that. We want to be looking at colorectal screenings. We, so it also is like this accountability that I do feel like some practices have shared with us that that being a part of that process is making sure that they're providing the best care and making sure they're looking at all these different areas of how, where and how they can improve. And so they're they're not inadvertently missing things again not in a negative way but just in a how do we hold ourselves accountable to the goals that we want to have in the work that we're doing and i think that's the positive feedback we get and and the value people feel in being um ncqa accredited in a patient center medical home if that makes sense Thank you. Um, representative cordis has a question how does the quality data get managed? Who manages it? Is that where the IRB gets involved? Um, how, so when you're looking, who manages the data about screenings and, um, and medical information about whether you're, you're meeting yep. the specific goals? How does that happen? And, and yeah. Sure. That's, that's a combination between well, certainly if it's a hospital, um, you know, uh, lots of hospitals have data uh, management departments um, that might work with our quality improvement facilitators. Um, our independent practices work with our quality improvement facilitators. There, there has to be someone in the practice that 
um, you know, understands what it means and they're they're working on that. Our, our quality improvement facilitators, you know, they're not there all the time, but they're helping support and 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 we, you know, again, we pay them as a blueprint, you know, contract to staff to um, through admin entities to do that work to support practices. But again, part of that earlier funding that Laura talked about, that is some in, uh, funding to help. Um, offset the cost of the time it takes for someone to do that work. Um, and then again, we have our quality improvement facilitators that can come in and help do that as well. And, you know, we know that hospitals and bigger organizations and small organizations have to report lots of other measures. So there's usually someone in the practice that is designated to be looking at HEDIS measure, other health effective data sets. There's other measures that they're looking at anyway for, um, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield outside of this kind of a thing. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Yeah. Oh, well, one more question here, sure. Representative. Wood. Oh. That's fine. And um, I'm just curious about our your ratings. I mean, how how are we doing, or how are you doing um, throughout the state with your your quality with through your measurements and everything. Mm -hmm. So trying to think of the best way to answer that. You so know, when I, I guess I could say pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic and and now at this point, you're probably recovering to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. we do a, a, a patient center medical home every year. Those results uh, survey our our CAP survey is what it's called, consumer. I'm, I'm going to forget the for I'm going to forget the acronym at this time. So we we are doing we do a survey in terms of how how people feel about their providers. But um, Laura, is there other data? Yeah. That, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we previously reported in in some previous annual reports that are available on our website, different you know resource utilization and, and quality metrics on different health service areas. We also um, produced. Um, data profiles um, at the HSA level for 2019 data that's available on our website that describes um, certain measures, how um, different health service areas are performing on those. We have an analytics contractor who works with um, the all pair claims database and with clinical data that we receive from VITAL to really look at some of the measures that we discussed um, on the previous slide about you know, the you know well um, adolescent well visits, um, different different metrics that um, we use to try to understand um, the, the quality of the healthcare provided in different health service areas. And so that's that's one way that we try to track how practices are doing. Um, for the most recent year, it's, it's difficult because of the pandemic um, utilization was so low that um, we're still trying to figure out how to kind of look at these recent years. But we can provide more information on um, quality metrics and additional testimony. Okay, thank you. I think we're all set. Okay, great. Uh, one of the tasks our program managers have is to facilitate an ac accountable communities for health um, meeting within their community. And that's again, where um, various community partners come together to really talk about what's happening in their community, where support's needed, how do we work together, how do we coordinate care, how do we collaborate, are there things we wanna work on together as a community? So um, some folks meet monthly, some folks meet bi-weekly, um, some folks have uh, different um, breakoff groups from these that might work on transitions of care or suicide prevention or things like that. So it's one of the areas that our program managers do, do work on bringing community, all community partners together. I'm going to talk a little bit about our hub and spoke programming and our pregnancy intention programming next. Our hub and spoke medication assisted treatment is Vermont's system of medication assisted treatment supporting people in recovery from opioid use disorder. And we know that this is considered a very effective treatment. Federal regulations designate two settings where medication assisted treatment can take place opioid treatment programs and office based opioid treatment settings, which a lot of times people refer to the OBOTs. So you may hear somebody say that. Um, sorry, 
my slides. Here we go. Our hub and spoke program starting in, started in 2013. So our hubs, which are called OTPs, opioid treatment programs, we have eight program sites. We'll show you a map in a second. Um, they dispense buprenorphine and Vivitrol in addition to methadone. Um, they provide care, care managers, counselors, nurses, psychiatry. Um, and there's a monthly bundled rate for methadone and home health services. Where we focus in the blueprint is, is the spokes. That's our charge to, to, to work on. And so that's the office-based opioid treatment. We have 75 practice setting with spoke community health team staffing. Um, so again, the, and we'll talk about this, this is an additional level of support to these practices where they receive, based on their patient counts, a full-time nurse and a full-time addiction or mental health counselor, counselor based on 100 patients. So if they, have, if they serve 75, it will be uh, prorated. But again, that funding goes to the administrative entity and, and the staff is then provided. Um, and, and it's considered part of our community health team. So you know, the thing we really focus on is the collaboration between the hubs and the spokes. And it's really important that we're, we're working closely together as community partners and providers to make sure that when we're seeing folks, we're getting them to the level of care they need, whether it's an intensity of a, a hub or moving to a spoke or vice versa, um, depending on, you know, what, what the person is struggling with and going through and needing for services. So uh, we really depend on each other in terms of providing that best care. A program that ADAP um, works on is um, what's called rapid access to medication, but I thought it was important to talk about is what we what we really try to do is if someone comes to an emergency department and they're saying, okay, I'm ready, I need, I need to stop using opioids. If there's a prescriber in the ED, they, they can start whatever makes sense to, to them. And then the goal is that they get them into whatever, again, service level they need within three days. So they have, we have these community agreements with each other <coughs> and they're unable, you know, there's no providers that, that, that are wavered to do that type of prescription. Um, they still have that commitment to get them into the level services they need within three days. So again, it's very important that we're working closely together as communities to address this. Um, and there are also emergency departments across the state that have recovery coaches um, that then they're called and made a connection um, with the patient to help support them to engage in whatever treatment they're desiring or just encourage, encourage them. So um, it's a very important program. Then Peterson has a question. Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at slide 19. I know we're back three from where you are That's now. Okay. <laughs> So if you can, you yep. know, look at the. Yep, I'm. I truly apologize. Um, I don't know why my um. You should, if you kept that view, you'd be able to just. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Nineteen is that what you said? Yeah. Sure. Accountable community for health will address the medical and non-medical needs that affect the measurement results and outcomes, including sure. social, economic, and behavioral factors. What does that mean? So for example, you know, a group might come together and they may say, um, you know, we want to, you know, work on um, housing. We want, we're finding in our community that this is the, there's, there's a situation with housing and we want to dig into that and see if we can do something about that. We, housing obviously is, is a challenging issue. Um, we know that we have X amount of unemployment rate and that, is an economic impact for our community. So how are we working together with Vogue Rehab? Are we finding that um, you know, folks aren't able to get jobs because maybe they have some type of um, you know, uh, record um, in the system that's impacting their work? And so is there something we can do? Can we work with Hannaford's? Can we work with other community partners or, or employers in this, in this area to make some kind of you know, work agreement? Or is there some, so really, it's really looking at in that particular community, what is making it challenging for people to feel successful, to get jobs, to get housing, um, to maintain their mental health? Is there not access to resources? Is there not a homeless shelter? Is there not a warming station? Is there not a food shelf, right? So it's coming together and looking at all those components to say maybe what are we lacking and what do we need in our community to kind of make all these needs 
um, be supportive and come together? Do we not have a peer network for folks that we really want to work on um, helping people be connected with other folks who have similar situations? Do we have a high pregnancy rate and we really want to support our folks on that? Do we not have daycare? Um, so does that help? Yeah, yes. I, I, but this is for folks that need it, correct? I mean, you're doing it on an individual basis for someone who has those needs. It's not a it's not something you're working on is a general part of what you do, but you're working on it yeah. for an individual who has some of those needs. On an individual basis, yes. But if we're, if the community is seeing patterns on certain things, then they might come together and say, you know, they're coming together monthly to say, wow, we have this issue that's is is just this thread through the community that we need to have more accessible X, Y, and Z. But yeah, so it's we're seeing it on an individual level and we're working on it. And then we're seeing it's a larger need for the community as a whole. So how do we as community partners address that? Okay, so if someone comes in with a health problem and they don't have a job. Yep. You reach out to places to try to get the person a job, is that? Sure, absolutely, yeah. You know, communities are really great and I feel like our community health team, they really know each other in the community. Like I would know who should I call at the food shelf? Somebody has a food. Here's my main <clears throat> contact at Vogue Rehab that always helps. You know, um, he, you know, so they have all those kind of tools and relationships across the community. So they're absolutely able to work together and support those, whatever the needs, the needs are. I mean, we know, you know, there's a shortage of housing. We know some other things, but if they're coming in, then we're, the community health team is taking that, addressing it, supporting it. Maybe there's a referral that needs to be made or another warm handoff to someone in the community um, to then work on that special need or whatever it is, but absolutely. Okay, you asking patients the questions that lead you to some of these uh, uh, things, is that what you do? Yeah, okay. so again, practices do it, can do it a little bit differently. So they screen for what, again, we call social determinants of health. So that's housing and food insecurity and interpersonal violence and depression and, and all those things. So um, we'd love to have more consistency as a state, certainly that everybody's doing it on the same, in the same way or using the same screening tools, but we also know it's important just to be screened um, and to be asking those questions. So um, hopefully, you know, also our, our folks need to be honest what might be going on for them. And then if they're, let's say they came in to get their, you know, uh, thyroid check because it's just that time to renew their medications. And then they come in and say, you know, I'm struggling, I don't have food, um, you know, I can't make ends meet. And then hopefully that provider is then saying, great, I've got um, Julie Parker here. I'd love for you to meet her. She um, really helps people with all those things. She's right down the hall. Let me go get her. And then ideally, then I would come in and be like, you know, happy to meet. Let's talk. Let me see what I can do. Shift out of that room, go to a different room talk about those needs, ask additional questions. You know, if I'm meeting with that person and we have very skilled people and I'm thinking there might be something else, let me, let me pull out a screening tool. Let me ask a few more questions about what might be happening. Um, and then again, so that's the screening brief or longer term interventions and helping that person navigate to, to the services that they need. So um, yeah, Thank you. yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think I will leave it like this so I can go back. Okay, so Laura, um, take it uh, 23, please. Yeah, so we often have people asking where are the hubs located across the state? And so this is a map of the current hub. So the, the green lines just um, show the, the territory, so to speak, for each hub where the hubs themselves are those orange dots. And so you can see that we have hubs pretty evenly spread throughout the state. Okay, so this graph shows the growth in our stroke program from uh, January 2013 to September 2021. So you can see that there's been a substantial growth in the number of spoke MAT prescribers, the number of uh, spoke Medicaid patients. Um, we have another metric that we use often, which shows the spoke medication assisted medication assisted treatment prescribers who have more than 10 patients on their panel because we feel like that's a, a 
greater level of engagement with the, the SPOKE program perhaps than one or two patients. And we also show that we have a substantial number of um, SPOKE medication-assisted treatment um, FTEs hired. So these are community health team staff that assist in the SPOKES. And I just want to emphasize that this the spoke program is a is a Medicaid program. So this is these are only Medicaid patients. And, and we define a spoke Medicaid patient as a patient who had a for whom Medicaid paid a buprenorphine or Vivitrol pharmacy claim. Uh, question, we have a question here from Representative Barris. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, is the increase attributable to um, increased in capacity or increased patients? So that's that's a tough question to answer. Um, we're always trying to determine, um, you know, what the whether there is sufficient access, but it's 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 a tricky question. Um, we do have um, we do believe that we have increased access for sure over the earlier years of the program, but there is also likely increased demand. Um, it's a little bit easier to measure at some of the spokes because they, they used to report, you know, the number of individuals on waiting lists. Um, but, but we, yeah, we, we don't have an easy answer for that. I apologize. Okay, thank you. The spoke services are pretty prescriptive in a way, you know, we, uh, with the community health team, as we talked about, it could be nurses or dietitians or mental health. Um, we're, we're very prescriptive in the spoke programming where again, with the hundred patients, it needs to be a nurse and it needs to be um, a, a counselor, mental health clinician, licensed a, a drug and alcohol counselor um, per the hundred patients. And this is just kind of um, prescribes, um, you know, what the tasks we're hoping that they're doing, which is very similar to the community health team generally, um, but there's an added level of the medical piece of things. So um, ensuring that, you know, safety in terms of use, discontinuing use, et cetera. So um, just a little snapshot of, of that. Um, and then um, uh, specifically what the, the funding is for, for, those, for those two positions that are then again gone to, going to the administrative entity to hire to move forward or, or passing through to an entity to hire. Okay, our next program is our, our pregnancy intention program. So um, our 45% uh, of all pregnancies um, are unintended. And so that's where uh, the PRAMS data from the um, Department of Health in 2018 and the Healthy Vermonters goal is to reduce that rate to 35%. So um, when, this, when this came forward in, in 2017, um, there was a conversation about, you know, are we talking about it enough with folks? And so, and, and is there access? Do people have access to contraception, to family planning, to discussion, to discussing their um, their hopes? And so, um, we are supporting um, our patient center medical homes and also our specialty practices, which is something a little bit different. And so, um, we ask that um, folks are asking one key question, which is what is your pregnancy intention? And so, if someone says, you know, I'm intending to get pregnant this year. Great. And so I did a screening with you and it looks like you're using a lot of substances. So how do we help support you having the healthiest pregnancy that you can? If someone says, you know, I'm not interested in getting pregnant this, this, you know, year, here are all your options that I just want to talk to you about as a provider. And so that you're knowledgeable and you can make a choice that you feel like is right for you. Um, if someone says that they are interested in contraception, then um, we want to encourage, um, as clinically indicated by our, our, our medical partners, that um, the moderate and most effective contraception, which is long-acting reversible contraception. And so um, we ask providers to be able to, to provide that same day, again, if all the clinical indicators are, are there. And we ask for additional screenings for those folks, um, again, around substance use, um, depression, uh, homelessness, uh, housing, food, all of those other things. And we also um, encourage care coordination agreements from specialty care, Planned Parenthood, uh, primary care, so that, again, we can get folks to where they need to be and that we're always continuing to build community partner uh, relationships. So. If a practice says, you know, I want to be involved in this programming, um, that is another payment that they can receive. And at this point, it is just a Medicaid program. 
Um, and so we have 46 practices, uh, 24 specialty practices, um, and 12 Planned Parenthood uh, practices. And we provide them with um, per member per month payments of $1.25 for ages 15 to 44, if they are interested in, in again, being part of this program. This is the first time we're really, well, besides the spoke, I should say, um, in a different way, we're digging into the specialty practices because we're at OBGYN practices if they'd like to engage. Um, and so another benefit is that we provide them, again, the specialty practices with funding to hire a mental health clinician. So if it's a patient-centered medical home that wants to do the pregnancy intention programming, they already have staffing there that's funded, but at specialty practices, OBGYN practices, they don't, they've never had that access to um, mental health that was, that was augmented. Maybe they chose to hire somebody, but that was augmented or supported by us. So um, we also provide a one-time payment to practices based on their um, attribution or client clients from 15 to 44 with Medicaid to have on-site um, uh, the LARC product. So that if, again, if someone comes in, they don't have to order from the pharmacy, wait, go pick it up from the pharmacy and have another appointment with their doc. They can say, you know, go through that process. And if they say, yes, I'm interested, all the clinical indicators make it safe, then they have it on the shelf. They can take it off and, and um, provide it to that person that's interested. So, um, so that's just another benefit of work that people are most likely already doing and talking about with their, with their patients um, that we're able to support. We have a couple of questions here, uh, Representative sure. Burris. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I have wondered whether whether there are uh, other services for women at the uh, Women's Health Initiative that aren't related to family planning. Yeah. So this is really a pregnancy intention program. Um, that's how it was, you know, funded. Certainly, if if you know, again, if, if someone's there for other reasons and we have a, a staff there, we would offer support. Um, and there are other programs. Um, there's something, there's a grant through like Department of Health um, called the Stamp Grant that helps um, pregnant moms and um, postnatal moms. And so there are some different funded programs at different specialty practices that we don't necessarily take the lead on, but there, there, there are some. I, just I was thinking more... Else uh, in terms of things like uh, complications related to menopause. And so I, I just want to interject one thing, which is that those PM, PM payments to the practices, those practices um, the and our one-time payment and the CHT payments, they are not based just on um, interactions that the payment that the patient has with the practice for contraceptive services. They also include other services relating to women's health. So it could be breast cancer screening. It could be, um, it could be annual well women visits. We do only include patients as attributed if they are ages 15 to 44, but that doesn't mean that they don't also receive the services of the community health team staff that are in place. Absolutely. So for the purposes of payment, it is that, that restricted age window, although a broader set of procedure codes than just associated with contraception, but um, the services are available to everyone at that practice. Thank you for the clarity, Laura. And uh, this is Representative Donahue. I have a question about um, uh, how, you, uh, how you monitor the indicator or whether, I mean, I guess I would assume it might be too early but maybe not. Are, are we reducing that 45% level at all that, we, that we're seeing? And, and how do we um, identify that? Yeah, we are continuing to work on, on managing that data, to be honest. And so it, it's a little bit challenging in terms of um, how it's measured through the PRAMs, through Vermont Department of Health. Um, so I, what else do you think you'd say about that, Laura? So I would say that pregnancy intention in Vermont as in most states is, me is measured through PRAMS, the Pregn Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring Survey, um, as Julie mentioned. And so that isn't something that, that we ourselves monitor, but we work closely with our, our colleagues at the Department of Health to understand what patterns they're seeing. Um, on our side, we do try to understand trends that we see in contraception, in um, annual well women visits, um, but 
we're still, that's kind of still a work in progress because this is a, a bit of a newer program. Um, so we're still working to try and understand how best to, to monitor some of these things for, because for example, you know, with um, long acting reversible contraceptive, um, you can't necessarily look at annual levels to understand what's going on because if a woman has a, a device inserted, she could have that for a number of years. And so um, you may not be looking, you, you have to kind of, um, trying to model the life cycle of these devices a, a little bit more. So it's a work in progress. Thank you. So I have a question. Uh, so this is Bill Lippert. Uh, for the Women's Health Initiative, is that, uh, it says it's, it's, is it restricted to Medicaid patients and the attribution is, is Medicaid only, is that correct? Yes. But it's and, payer agnostic as well. Like yeah. we really, we always go into these. I mean, we would never, it, if there's a Blue Cross Blue Shield payment person, if there's a Cigna, our resources are going to be there for anybody. But in terms of actual where okay. the so, money is coming so from, it's just in terms of actually providing the service, you're payer agnostic, whatever patient might benefit from it. But the Absolutely. payment, the practice is a Medicaid payment and an attribution. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So I said, and, and it's and it's a, a patient a practice would apply to be part of that particular initiative. I see it's, it's 46 practices, is that right? Which yeah. of course yep. there was a hundred and hundred. So not all practices choose to participate in the special initiative. Special practice, it's not the primary care practice. There's some primary care practices that don't have providers that are comfortable um, providing anything but oral contraceptives. So they, they're not comfortable. Um, even though uh, in this program, we actually provide training. We contract with uh, Dr. McAfee, who is a fantastic um, doctor at the UVM Health Network. So we provide training opportunities and education, but there are just some primary care docs that aren't comfortable doing, doing that type of work. Um, and so, but as we'll see on the next slide, um, it has grown quite quite a bit um, since its inception in 2017. Right. And just uh, as I remember the data from the hub and spoke, it, the, the graph showed it said it was Medicaid, mm -hmm. but, but the hub and spoke is, uh, is that, is the payments for, is that strictly attributed to Medic, based on Medicaid as well? Yes. So the spoke patients, the spoke payments are based only on the Medicaid patient panel, the, the providers, although once again, the services are available to everyone. I was going to say, I always understood the services are broadly available, however, is that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to confirm it's, that. It's payment agnostic as well. For the hub. Yeah. For, and yep. the me medication assisted treatment is payment agnostic as well. Is that correct? The, for the community spoke health team staff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. For the spoke services, we, we yes. We have a hard time because we're speaking over each other. So I'll just be silent and maybe you can answer the question. One of you can answer the question again. Is, it, is the medication assisted treatment program payment payer agnostic as well? So the community health team staff that we fund through the spoke program are payer agnostic. The claims for the medication go through the, the um, individuals insurer. So we provide those wraparound services through the spoke community health team staff and every person, regardless of, of their payer, can access those. So those services are, are payer agnostic, but not the medication assisted treatment itself. So if someone got a prescription that, and they had Blue Cross Blue Shield, they, that their prescription would go through their Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, but if they're at a site and they just need wraparound support on anything, that is payer agnostic. So anybody can come in, meet with a spoke nurse, meet with a spoke counselor. Anybody can have that, that level of services. Thank you. Absolutely. I just want to yeah, add. Just, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I just thought of a question. In that scenario, or when you're working with um, patients throughout this whole process, what if someone comes? Well, I mean, rephrase this. If someone comes in who is uninsured, is there any conversation about helping them either have you know get on Medicaid or work mm -hmm. with an insurance company? 
Absolutely. Yep. That's a lot of work the community health team does um, for sure. Folks definitely come in. They've just moved here. They've lost their insurance. They've lost their job. They've gotten a new job. There's a waiting period, you know, so absolutely. When okay, I talk about you. the community health team, like having all the tools in their tool belt, like they have to have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things um, to help um, for sure. But that is definitely one thing they, they support quite a bit. Thank you. So I just, I, I would like to add something just for clarity. So uh, all of these payments that the Blue Crip provides are on top of regular fee-for-service reimbursement that clinicians receive for the services. So um, we are not replacing the fee-for-service that a clinician would get for doing a work insertion, but we're, we're helping to fund additional services around that work insertion and help support and make that work insertion more possible with a one-time payment potentially. Um, so this figure shows the, the development of the Women's Health Initiative. So it is our newest program. And so um, it doesn't have quite as much growth as, um, for example, the PCMHs, because we still um, have some, some room to grow. But at this point in time, we have 22 patient-centered medical homes who are participating. And this is as, 20, as of 2021, quarter three, and 24 women's specialty practices. Um, we have a little bit over 13,000 um, patients that are attributed to those specialists. And across um, all of our women's specialty health specialty practices, we have 15.9 CHT staff as of 2021 quarter three. So those patients that are attributed to specialists are Medicaid patients. So I, I have a, I have a well, I have a question broadly. The Women's Health Initiative, how, what, what generated that to be part of the blueprint for health? What was the impetus or the initiative that made, brought it to be part of the, to add it to the blueprint for health? Was that, where, where did that initiative come from? Does, does anybody speak to that? I don't, Ina might have a history. I don't honestly fully know. I wasn't, I've been here about two plus years. Um, I, I'm guessing, again, Ina, please stop me if you know different. I, I, I think that it was the PRAMS data and there was some conversations because I've looked back at some documents of the planning committees. Um, there was some conversation, it appears from Maternal Child Health and Vermont Department of Health. And they came together to look at the pregnancy rate. And my understanding is from those planning meetings and discussions that, that this came to fruition. Um, but I, and that's just kind of me going back and reading some, some notes on that. But if Ina or Laura, if I'm missing um, the history, I'm missing some history, obviously, please, you know, fill that in. I can look back further, but that's my, that it's is my that. understanding. Yeah. I think Representative, Representative Goldman. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I think that a lot of women get their primary care of their own GYN people yeah. so that it made sense to integrate those two ideas of okay. where they get their primary care. Yeah. But I just was curious as to who, who or how it came to be that they said, let's use the blueprint for health as a model. For I can't speak to that, but it, that when they were looking at the population of where primary care was obtained, it could be in either place. I, I think it was also a priority of the one of the previous AHS secretaries. Um, that's that's what I'm understanding as well. But I yes, I do think the broader picture of where are people getting their health services and um, where can we be asking the question, what's your pregnancy intention? How can we support you? Um, and, and we know a, a lot of folks may not go to special care or, or may not see a OBGYN every year for an annual visit, but instead they go to their primary care for their annual visit. So I think, uh, I think it was a few things that came together um, is my understanding. Um, but just, I think broadening again, that home health as we're talking about that whole care, where do, where do I get my health services um, and ensuring we're asking all, all pertinent questions about health. And as, as Julie mentioned, um, and spoke to early in the presentation, the Blueprint program and the staff that work in the central office at, at the Agency of Human Services have a lot of skills and expertise to drive innovation. And so when a problem may be identified or an issue is identified, 
the blueprint has in its toolbox um, uh, data and information to inform uh, a potential strategy to address the issue, as well as um, a staff that can can formulate a new payment model or delivery system redesign or an innovation to answer uh, the issue. So I think in that way, the I don't have all the history about how the issue came to arise, but it was an issue that, that was one um, that certainly the blueprint uh, could um, <coughs> use, its, use its strength and its engine for innovating in delivery in delivery system change and bring that to bear for addressing the issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question that, uh, that I'll save for the, it's more global. So after you, after you finish the, the current set of slides, but uh, Representative Page has a question right now. Are, are there any other um, types of care that you're looking to expand uh, with your program besides the women's health specialty programs, um, maybe child care. Uh, I do see specialties do cover uh, mental health um, care of some sort or referrals to specialists. Mm -hmm. We do include pediatric practices in our, our patient center medical home program. Mm -hmm. um, so there are existing um, pediatric practices within our existing programs. Um, just as you know. Yeah, I, and again, I, if Ina wants to speak I, I, to this too, I think um, we are always innovating. And I think we've, you know, as everybody has been in a reactionary mode as needed for the past two, two years due to COVID. So I feel like our fingers are crossed, right? That we're coming towards a, a, a different, era here. And I think that our innovation engines are starting to go in a way um, where we're talking about some different programming and some things that the community has now been able to, to start thinking about again. And that's what we're hearing from our program managers is like, I feel like I could probably take a small breath here. And, and now I want to, you know, readjust and, and think about some future goals um, of new innovations of work that we might want to do. But I don't know that we have anything specifically right here on the uh, that we have to share today that I know of. But lots of ideas and lots of innovations we're talking about as a team, for sure. And, and some key, key priority, priority areas as well, such as um, focusing on access to primary care, focusing on furthering and strengthening um, the programs that um, drive towards integrating mental health and substance use disorder services, for example, are key, are key objectives that we are looking at in the coming year. Absolutely. Thank you, Ina. Yeah, I mean, we're a big part of the Mental Health Integration Council around integration. So there's lots of, lots of things happening for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, could you address a little bit more about um, your interactions, I guess, with the mental health clinicians um, with your program? Sure. Uh, do you mean outside the primary care or mental health clinicians that connect to like well, the designated? Either one. Pardon me? Both would be fine. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. We, well, um, most practices, I would say, do have some hours or embedded um, mental health clinician. And I think that we're always working and strengthening our relationship with both private practitioners and communities and our designated agency. You know, we're working together with Department of Mental Health around mental health integration. We have a lot of subcommittees that we're working on in terms of how do we integrate that. Um, I am a member of our um, uh, suicide prevention committee. And like, for instance, last year, um, we did what we called a primary care mini grant where departmental health shared some funds with us. And we funneled those to the primary care offices to do some additional training on um, different suicide prevention uh, clinical models. And also part of the funding was used to have um, primary care folks, uh, clinicians and nurses actually working with designated agencies, crisis and clinicians to start talking about pathways to care so that there's a mutual, you know, working towards higher level care, again, lower level care. How do we, how do we support folks from emergency departments 
back to their primary care and or again to the designated agency system or independent clinicians. So um, that's an example of something that we've been working on and talking about um, in, for the future. You know, could we can we do that again? How do we continue that work? So I think we're always looking at building relationships with community partners. And I think, um, you know, some areas, some some health service areas might say the relationship is great with X, Y and Z. And other people will say, gosh, we need to work on a relationship with SASH or the DA or you know, what have you. So that really is a part of that earlier accountable communities for health where those groups come together and, and talk about, again, referral pathways, working together, um, effective treatment, clinical care for folks in their community, um, general health and wellness. So it's always a work in progress, but something I feel like um, communities are really committed to um, because we can't do we can't do it without each other. I mean, that's really the key and what we talk about as communities. We all need each other um, to support each other. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Of course. Uh, just we're we're looking at uh, probably wrapping up around three thirty. So okay, perfect. Um, so, so I think we're um, on track, but I think those um, your history of the blueprint uh, slides are uh, have some important. Uh, Bullet points okay. there when we get to that. Yeah, sure. So, um, Laura, do you want to briefly touch on these two and then? Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. so in the interest of kind of speeding through these, we engage in a variety of different sorts of research and evaluation initiatives. We have um, different profiles of our different programs available on our website. Um, we've mentioned some of these before: the annual reports, um, community profiles. Um, yeah, so those are some resources that are available to understand our programs in a little bit more detail. And so we use a variety of data sources to produce those. Um, I'll just kind of speed through this, that we get um, data in our Blueprint portal, which is a web portal that we have that allows our field staff to enter information about community health team hires. And that helps us understand the community health team locations and, and scale in different parts of the state. We also have access to identified Medicaid claims. We have access to the Vermont Healthcare Uniform Reporting and Evaluation All Care Claims Database. Um, we receive clinical data extracts um, from Vermont information technology leaders, and we also administer and receive data on the patient satisfaction. Um, the con consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems, the CAPS um, patient center medical home survey. So there's a, probably a few things I've missed on that slide, but we, we have a variety of data that we use to try and understand our programs. Great. So we, we've made this timeline just with some snippets. And certainly if there, you know, you want additional information. Um, but, you know, we started in 2003 with Governor Douglas to who wanted to control the cost. For, yeah, if I could just inject a question, because my question actually um, uh, that was brewing in my head actually ties into this. And okay. so I'm wondering if you do the timeline, when you're referencing different components of the blueprint, the heading of this is the history of the blueprint. Sure. So I'm interested in that interrelationship, how you're connecting it as part of the history of the blueprint sure. when the ACO or the all payer model and how those connect um, when there's yeah. multiple places, insurers do care management, the ACO does, does care management, the blueprint does care management. And, yeah. and so, so really, if I'm understanding sort of where this all comes together here, and I'm just wondering, Ina, if you want to speak to that when we're talking about the, where the ACO sort of began here in 2012 and then which led to the agreement, et cetera. Is that what I'm understanding? I'm, Are you I'm asking about yeah, I think I think the question is the question is about the interaction between the blueprint for health as a multi-payer program and the accountable care organization, all payer accountable care organization model agreement, which is also a multi-payer or we all all payer um, program. Is that is that the question? Yes, how they interconnect, because this is labeled as all the history of the blueprint, and it injects, you know, all these other pieces. And I've always had a question or concern about 
we have all these different models for care coordination and are we um, you know, overlapping or uh, missing people because there's different organizations all doing care coordination? The blueprint does serve as this very important foundation of primary care for the state of Vermont. And of course, when we look to, again, transition from the primary, excuse me, transition um, to new payment models that really put an emphasis on health and well being uh, and that allow providers to shift in how they're delivering care relative to a budget, uh, the strength and the base or the baseline of the, of the strong primary care network in the state of Vermont is very important. So that's the first way that we think about the interaction with the Blueprint for Health and the All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. I really think that you know, the Blueprint being an established program in the state of Vermont for years preceding the agreement provided for um, some certainty among our federal partners that Vermont was that Vermont was well positioned um, for further payment reform in the state because it could draw on that foundation of strong primary care with its particular assets being the community health teams uh, as one of those assets for um, coordinating care um, for promoting the in more further integration of services across the care continuum and all of the other activities that Julie is explained so well in the presentation this afternoon. The other way that the blueprint uh, very much overlaps with or why it's important that there's a timeline that indicates the all-payer ACO model alongside the blueprint is because the all-payer ACO model is a model that at the heart of it, the agreement that we have with the federal government really at its core is about how Medicare can join with other payers in paying differently for healthcare in Vermont. Medicare is, is certainly a, a large a portion of Medicare beneficiaries are a large portion of Vermont's insured population. And without Medicare's participation, as we look to transform care, you know, we, we would see uh, the incentives weakened for providers. Um, so with Medicare's participation in the all-payer model, that's how funding from Medicare as a payer continues and is carried through to the blueprint where Laura was showing the slide that demonstrates the dollars per person per month uh, for Medicare beneficiary, that those dollars are flowing because Vermont has a contract with our federal partners that allows Medicare to join in payment reform in our state. So I think those are the, those are the key ways where we see the interaction on the timeline. And again, the care coordination activities um, and the uh, risk stratification models, for instance, that the accountable care organization has utilized do build on the existing foundation and resources from the Blueprint for Health. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, any other questions as, uh, as uh, wrap up kind of questions? As we oh look perfect slide yes questions thoughts <laughs> well I, I want to just say that um, I've over the number of years certainly been familiarized with different aspects of the blueprint for health but this is help, this is helpful to me in refreshing my sense of some of the more recent initiatives uh, of the blueprint. And, and how it builds on the foundation of the patient medical home, patient-centered medical home, I guess that's the acronym we're using. Um, and I appreciate, while, while it's, there are times it's still hard to kind of figure out how it all fits together, 
in terms of the per member per month and which initiative is funded by which payer. Uh, but I, I appreciate understanding more and uh, continuing to appreciate what the what the issues are. I think I'm left with there's one one question which I'm not going to try to ask us to answer now, but I'll just put it on the table, which is you can only have a patient centered medical home if you have a primary care provider. That's a given, but if someone doesn't have access to a primary care provider, they are, I guess my question is, I guess they are, le they are left by definition, left out of access to primary care and healthcare, uh, except through to free clinics. And well, that's, that's a whole nother conversation, but that, that, that the blueprint is built on the system of primary care. And that's, again, one of the, yeah. one of the foundational important backbones of healthcare in Vermont that we want to continue to strengthen and value. I so think I'll, just, I'll leave it there. I was just going to say real quick, and I'm sorry, jets are going over here if, if you're hearing noise. I think we're also working really hard to ask folks about, do they have access to primary care? So I think it's mandated now in the Department of Mental Health, like in their intake questionnaires and with Dale and SASH and other community partners that really any door someone's coming in, working hard to ask, do you have a primary care doctor? Can I help you find one? You know, can I connect you to those resources? So even if somebody at the food shelf called St. Albans Primary Care and said, I have someone here and they really need primary care. Do you have openings? That community health team worker could meet with that person and get them engaged, get record, whatever they need, or even just talk to them. Maybe they don't want to go to that. Maybe they want another primary care office and that's okay. So that person could help them. So that is a, a goal to ensure that people have the care that they need. So I, sorry, I just wanted to note that last piece. No, I, I, I actually appreciate that response. So that part yeah. of the community health team response is that anyone yes. who does not have primary care, part, one, of yeah. their, one of their pieces of work would be to try to help connect them with yes. a primary care practice. That, that's actually very helpful to hear. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you very much. We always feel um, appreciative when we're asked to talk about our program because again, we feel passionate about it. I feel passionate about it. I've worked in communities. This is my passion in life. And so um, I'm just really always pleased to talk about it. So thank you very much for, for having us here. And we're happy to answer further questions and the money piece can be challenging at times. You gotta hear it a few times, even myself. And uh, we're so thankful to have our data team as well that helps walk us through some of those things. Um, Cause I'm not a complete data person uh, being a more clinical person. So thank you. I think we have one last question. I just comment. wanted to thank you, Julie, actually, for giving an example of St. Albans, because I think we, it's easier to imagine when you're specific. I know in a study, they've done a really wonderful set of work. So sometimes when there's specific examples to help us, that would be helpful when we meet again, which I'm sure we will. Thank Absolutely. you. Well, thank, yeah. thank you all. Thank you, Ina and uh, others. Let's call it a wrap for today. We've had a busy, long week. Uh, Chair Lipper. Uh, yes. Before we go, can I just um, say thank you to you oh, all? I, I'm and, sorry. Um, I, did, I was trying yeah. to figure out what voice this was. I was looking for the... It's okay. <laughs> and I have the just going over. Please. I have yeah. the just yeah. going over too, so you might hear like... Um, We're close. We must be close together then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I'm at home right now in Burlington in the old North End. Um, I just want to thank you all for the work you're doing. And... Um, and I'm wondering if I could forward an email to you that I had sent out to the General Assembly and Governor about the social determinants of health, just to um, see your if you had any thoughts about that and you'd want to talk with me more, because I've been talking with different members of the administration and learning more about what's already happening and how to enhance it. And I feel like we, are, we just did a lot of that in our budget, which was great, but I feel like we could always do more. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank you and then ask if you'd be willing to take a look and maybe just check back in, but I don't want to create extra work. It'd be more if you like had any thoughts like, oh, you might want to look at this or that. Anyone that knows me knows that I have thoughts about any, everything. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a talker and I'm always any, and help anybody would I'm sure be willing to as well, but yeah. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Well, I'm going to. Bring this to a close officially for us today. Uh, thank you, Representative Donahue, for facilitating. And uh, let's.